Hello, and I hope you have your favorite beverage. Hopefully it's not whiskey or something like that <laughs> this early in the day, or I guess this late in the day if you're in cheery old England. Did that sound sarcastic? Yes, it did. I'm sorry. It's only that way for certain people. So uh, here we are on What is Truth, episode 43. Four and three is seven. So that's a, a clue that, that can provide us a clue to understanding the inwardness of our uh, adventure here. And as, as Lady Adventure says in both from Von Eschenbach's Parsifal, I just want to enter your heart, just a small space in your heart. And uh, that's what we're trying to do here. If we can just accomplish a little bit toward a connection between the head and the heart, that lemnus gate form that's, that's so important regarding our move into the future, which I was reminded of from my dear friend in Russia, the anthroposophic Dr. Yuri, it's, it's all about lemniscates. And the lemniscate, the figure eight, it's kind of hard when I look in the picture and it's going the other way. So there's inverted lemniscate too. And I guess what we want to get into at this point in pursuing truth, we have to con continually contextualize uh, our conversation here because it's challenging, I know. And some people, they'll, they'll turn away, away pretty quickly when they find that we're speaking about things spiritual. And uh, that's okay because they think they can answer everything with a linear scientific uh, formula. <laughs> There's one great formula that rules the universe for all time. When, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth at times. And that's the thing is, is as, as I made the point before, Rudolf Steiner said to, about presenting facts, it's like they get into presenting all, a series of facts and then and connect them all together. It's, it's, it's this constructive thinking. And, and Rudolf Steiner says, yes, but is it is it a relevant fact to what you're talking about? And that's, that's the difficulty because spiritual science is, makes physics look like child's play when you start really getting into it and trying to understand the workings of the spiritual hierarchies, the divine spiritual powers. And then you bring in the, the other side of the equation, which is the abnormal spiritual powers and how those two are in this kind of struggle and out of the struggle has arisen a lot of the uh, attributes of mankind, including freedom. Because were there not this opposition and we were just well-behaved automatons, that wouldn't be the same result. So that what was needed was that there was this intervention as depicted in Genesis, you know, the, with the Garden of Eden, that whole scene is one facet of that. Although you can go much earlier in cosmic evolution and find this, this principle of uh, countervailing streams, we could call them. Because if you look and you see that, that we're just trying to make the point that everywhere you look, you see spirals, galaxies are spirals and plants, you see spirals and all of that. So everything is, has risen out of the, the vortical activity and that, that what is, what are described as as atoms, they're vortices that cause a, a 
particular way of, of working of the light, which is the source of being. And so without getting too complicated, which is a difficult thing to do, because you see, like for example, in our solar system, when you look at light, what does it do? It, Rudolf Steiner talks about how it goes out, the solar wind goes out to, to around the planet Saturn's orbit and then comes back. And so there's this other attribute of light, the returning light, that, that it's, it's, he even describes it like it's, it's elastic and, and that we don't really see the light unless it encounters something. That's, that's what's difficult to understand for many people. And when you get into Goethe's theory of color, in opposition to uh, Newton's theory of color, you see these things revealed. And so if you, if you go and, and you look up that, there's a video that, that I have included in one of my folders on YouTube of uh, Goethean theory of color. And you can look that up and watch it. It's very intriguing because Goethe referred to color as the deeds and sufferings of light. And so you see that this, this whole idea of variance. And Rudolf Steiner is critical of, of uh, people that make commentary, philosophical commentary, religious commentary, and so forth. And they get into comparing things. And they go, oh, they have this, that, and the other thing. Therefore... And he says they forget to get into talking about the differences. And so that it's that approach of wanting to uh, take a partial view and abstraction and make that your understanding of the totality. In fact, I was watching a movie last night with Barbara and there was this uh, scene in the movie. It was very unusual because they're talking uh, about art, and, and they start talking about uh, abstract art, and they start talking about how it uh, relates to Gustav Klimt, the artist, and, and then you get into the theosophic milieu that was around Gustav Klimt and all of that, and then Rudolf Steiner's name comes up in a movie, which, when does that ever happen? But they said, no, he didn't care for the, the abstract art, which is interesting because that, that's not entirely true because you have uh, Vasily Kandinsky's Concerning the Spiritual and Art, and, and Kandinsky was, was inspired by the, the uh, work of Rudolf Steiner. But yet he went in the direction of abstraction, but he was very much a colorist. And they, the important part is the color aspect of, of Vasily Kandinsky's art. And so it depends upon what you're getting at when, when see, and that's the, the thing is this, all this, it's all about nuance. And that's what makes it so challenging because if we go back to uh, Zarathustra in the late Stone Age, and he, he starts making his, his uh, proclamations where, and where he talks about uh, Zervan Akarana, which is like translated variously like boundless time, uncreated time. Here's an here's a important study that's, I just looked it up out of curiosity and uh, it's not generally available and so uh, in the rare book trade, they, geez, I saw one for 1200 bucks, but that's ridiculous. But this is a, a, a nice reprint that I got years ago, an exploration of the Persian uh, views of Zervan Akarana. And Rudolf Steiner gets into talking about the, the uh, influence of Zarathustra in the development of ideas. And it's important to understand when talking about these great individuals, where they are geographically and 
at what point in time this took place. Because to contextualize that, we'll go back to about 10,000 years ago with the final sinking of Atlantis that's described by Plato in uh, his dialogues. And you see that there's uh, this great civilization that went into decline and there was all kinds of their version of mad scientists, so to speak, uh, working their black arts, kind of similar to the way it is today with the, what's going on. But that there was this assertion of the inverse uh, powers the, the, and lower spirits and all of that uh, going into decadence as described in Noah, that, that that there's all this wickedness, and so it had to be the slate had to be wiped clean, and but the next period following Atlantis, you see in Atlantis, the, uh, in Niflheim, the land of mists, you see that there's this consciousness that's not individuated and that it's a dreamlike awareness relative to the physical world, that the physical world was like a dream to the ancient Atlanteans. And as we moved into the next period, the first post-Atlantean period of 2,160 years, in the age of cancer, that you find that the Manu, the Noah type figure leading the, the northern migration into Central Asia and out of that central mother lodge of humanity that proceeded from the Sun Mystery Center in Atlantis, uh, impulses would, would come forth over time under the inspiration of, of various hierarchical beings, angelical hierarchies as described in Dionysius the Areopagite and elsewhere all throughout the work of Rudolf Steiner. And so, but he says that, that in the old Indian period, which is the root of Indian culture to this day, there was really no provision for the ego. And that's important when you start to study uh, Hindu philosophy is, is that they really don't have a provision for that. And so when you get into Blavatsky and her interpretation of things in the secret doctrine, she's, you know, she says there is no abiding principle, meaning that there is no uh, contiguous uh, entelechy that, that, that is of any consequence. And that the goal, like you hear so often, the goal of nirvana, that you want to be liberated into, you know, go into the absolute and just eternal bliss kind of uh, scenario, which is a very high thing. And there is such a thing and not to speak against it, but to understand it. Because see, in the first post-Atlantean period, the, the Manu and the seven Rishis were, were the, the principal aspect of development in humanity at that time and in the high point with the, the archai of that time had to do with the development of the etheric body. And so you have this etheric body that, that Rudolf Steiner elsewhere describes as higher feelings. And so you, if you get into uh, Advaita Vedanta of Shankaracharya that came you know, much, much later, and the writings of uh, Abhinava Gupta, most of which haven't even been translated into European languages, but many salient texts have. His work is so, uh, his corpus is huge. But if you get into understanding the uh, take of, of this, shall we say, Advaita means non-dual, that it's all one, the universe, it's all one. So it's kind of this, this monotheistic view in a sense, but 
if you get into Vedic thinking, you see that they have three principles. So there, there are threefold, uh, but yet there's this higher unity, which is akin to the Zervan principle, uncreated time of Zarathustra that came later. Well, the, the principal student of the Manu, aside from the seven rishis, their, their uh, uh, particular development of their own, that's a, another matter. But there were various students of uh, the, the master, the Manu, in Atlantis. And one of those, the highest developed one was uh, Zarathustra, who in the following period in the age of Gemini, Zarathustra uh, took mankind's development a step further. And it's important to understand that because it, it became more earthly. So you see within the, the teachings of Zarathustra, rather than just this negation of, of uh, the world of generation, shall we call it, the material world, the wanting to return to the idyllic existence beyond the material world, uh, nirvana, it had to do with working into the world and agriculture and development and, and all of those things. So it had to do, in, in that regard, had to do with the actual astral development and affinity, the mystery of affinity in, in that regard which has a certain relationship to old moon, whereas the Eric body to old sun and the physical body to old Saturn. So that in Zarathustra, the seed is planted, but yet he's carrying forward also the gifts that he'd receive from his, his teacher, Manu. So you have Zarathustra with a very highly developed etheric body and astral body. And working into these was able to develop in, in the Iranian plateau the civilization that, that evolved is in the old Persian period for 2,160 years. And following that into the period of the sentient soul, which is the Egypto-Chaldean period. And the, the sentient soul is the first articulation into the astral body. That's followed by the intellectual soul in, in the Greco-Roman period, which is an articulation into the etheric body. We're in the spiritual soul period or consciousness soul period. So that's actually an articulation into the physical body. And that's the important thing to understand, especially in light of some of the comments that I made last week when I was speaking to Douglas Gabriel, is that we actually have a physical aspect of our nature that has been worked into for the sake of being able to have a relationship to the intentions of the divine spiritual power that was developed in us during the age of Gabriel before 1879. And now it's the mission of the archangelic period of Michael that we're currently in to be able to take up this impulse and utilize that uh, development within the frontal uh, convolutions of the brain that was brought about by the archangel Gabriel and that we should work into it with Michaelic thought and utilize it as a bridge to the intentions of the divine spiritual powers. If people don't take that up, it will atrophy. Everybody has that potentiality, but not everybody's going to avail themselves of that opportunity. Reverend David from the city of London and merry old England. How are you there, my friend? Uh, good to be back on the show, John. My God, what a preamble. How, how am I meant to comment on that? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, the sun is shining. There's a bit of a, a, a breeze, which is always nice. Of course, I and my partner are hoping to move to the City Isles, uh, which is sort of perpetual spring. You, you get past Cornwall on the way to France and you find yourself in a magical microclimate um, where you, it's British springtime forever. So, yeah, so I'm looking at a nice sunny London day, but dreaming of St. Mary's in the City Isles. Um, oh, you said a lot. Where do I begin? Um, the best bit of art crit I heard in years was actually uh, a year or so ago in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, where, because most art crit is just appallingly brain dead, um, when they, you know, even when there are lots of complicated things to say, people don't say them or they say them in the wrong way or they got the wrong end of the stick. Um, and it was, I can't remember this, and everybody in Buffy the Vampire Slayer is arguing about sort of, I don't know what, goings on on set at the minute so i can't remember which character it was the sort of short fat policeman who's not known for his mental capacities who um was one of the vampires or something or other was involved in the world of art and all of a sudden this this <laughs> this guy goes on about the existential which must transmute into the human at this particular juncture <laughs> with the use of color and line and i oh my god how wonderful and he's challenged um, in the program, how do you do that? To which he says he reads lots of magazines in the John. Um, so I'm assuming that means toilet. At least I thought it did. And yet, why not get an education wherever you can? Um, yeah, the loo. The loo. Is a <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the best bits of art crit I've heard in a while. Um, I don't understand this. I don't understand the limitations, the self-imposed limitations of modern discourse. Um, once upon a time, some people said you couldn't be religious and scientific. Yeah, and where are they now? And that, that whole thing is now moving into you can't be spiritual and scientific. I mean, where would it end? You can't be scientific and scientific. It's just brainless. Uh, you can't be rational. You can't be... Uh, it's, it's all mindless. It's, there's nothing. There's nothing real to it. So it, you're now saying you can't have a particular type of human sensibility uh, because that's what spirituality is. It's, it's not the full blown shooting match of religion. You're now saying you can't have an abstract and sophisticated relationship with the environment and be scientific. I mean, who who comes up with this stuff? And uh, you know, what are they talking about? And university campuses these days with any active brain cells, because it actually doesn't seem to be that much. I'm getting to detest millennials, you know, who don't mind opening their mouths to reveal a vast vacuity, a vast emptiness within. And apparently they're happy with it. I'm not happy with it. Um, you know, shut up, just shut up. And if you haven't got something to say, shut up. So yeah, I, these, these false divisions. I mean, also, you know, remember the, the sort of, um, operatic you know staged matches between the darwinians and the sciences in victorian times all of which decided to ignore that darwin darwin was a unitarian the family were unitarians you know so uh, details you know they're they're only small but they say everything and also if you look at the science of the 70s fritjof capra the Tao of physics everything's like the dance of shiva well why is it okay then and not okay now uh, because actually nobody's nobody's saying his science was wrong, so he's not meant to have a creative view of science. You know, does does everybody just want to be a robot working on one one dimension, working in one monolinear way? I mean, what's the great advantage of that? I notice even the Vulcans, since I'm talking about imaginary TV things today. I mean, at the end of the day, they, they they're quite heavily into Vulcan mysticism. I notice. Um, where you get very famous character actresses turning up on a Vulcan, trying to help the soul, the cadre of Mr. Spock, go from one 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 body to another. So they're up to it, you know, they're up to their arse in mysticism. So you know, there's there's slightly more to it than that. Um, oh, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with the modern world at the minute. It loves making limitation. I can't help feeling there are dark forces somewhere. And maybe they're not as far away as we want to think, which would make us all a bit more uncomfortable. 
that one one way of thinking and one way of interacting with the world and one way of behaving that isn't human that's not natural and that is at the end of the day demonic um and it's an offense to the the creative creator and all of his creativity um i was reading curiously this morning about the Def department of defense uh, i i'm sure it's not limited to the american department of defense i'm very sure the british are as bad if not worse um certain people in the department of defense have got scientists to look into the fact they can use magnets to make people less religious and in uh, invoke seizures cause seizures and traumas whenever they want to i mean if people don't believe in black magic or the, the mindset of black magic and the fact these things never happen they must have their head firmly up their proverbial because it's happening in front of people you know monsanto and the terminator project it took me ages to work out what they mean and, and it's an offense against the holy spirit the terminator project is to stop seeds germinating um in other words that which they do naturally life giving birth to life giving birth to life no that's no good let's let's stop that happening and make sure everybody is financially dependent on our stock I mean, that is demonic. That's throwing the gift of life back in the face of the creator. That is absolutely obscene. And people seem okay with that. You know, what sort of nightmarish hell are we all going to get, end up in? And, you know, when will people finally think, oh, I, I'm not just conforming anymore. Now I'm in the middle of hell. Um, I'm getting less tolerant in my dotage of conformity and conformists because actually they're the bridge between what's worse that comes down the road a bit. Uh, you know, I'll let them get a, away with just a bit more and just a bit more. It's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with my life. It's the guy down the road. It's not affecting me. You know, I mean, that's what they thought in Nazi Germany uh, until everybody was informing on everybody or the Gestapo used to turn up at your door. You know, we've got to be really careful about the, the road to hell because it's still paved with good intentions and it's just as slippery as it used to be but the black magic that surrounds us the the, the sorcery of these companies and these so-called people trying to defend us i mean th this really must be noticed for what it is and stopped um when it comes to the, the old hippie in me you've managed to ev evoke the old hippie in me John. um when it comes to nirvana oh my god i just want to be a nirvana um you know i just want to hang around in nirvana and just just look at sunflowers all day wouldn't that be wonderful i mean certainly this will shock everybody when i was at university um i majored in hinduism can you believe that do we so um because i wanted i wanted i used to read first time round all the atheists right what have they got to say let's look at them and none of them have a convincing and comparable worldview on on an equal footing on an equal level to theists none of them and nobody wants to admit that but everybody who's read the, the works knows that's true even carl sagan i like carl sagan hugely and i think it was him it was uh, years back holding up a placard you know uh, uh, people who you can never convince a, a believer because they want to believe it's you know something science is always right whether you believe in it or not which of course isn't true there is no continuous history of science. Uh, basically, you're looking at theories failing and being proved to be false by a new guy that comes in. Is They present it like this continuous unfolding of human knowledge, but that's simply not the case and it's not true. Um, you know, Einstein comes in and blows away Newton, the end. Um, so that's just nonsense and it's theater. It's the new religion posturing around instead of the, allowing the old religion to do it, which was posturing around too, I admit it. But you know, so you know, religious people—they've got this deep-seated need to believe. You know, how condescending, how pompous! And you mean you don't? You don't have the deep-seated need to believe in your infallible scientific practice, even though I can show you now that's not the history of science. And I mean the most mundane, the most practical, the most materialistic sort of science. That is not what occurred. Um, but getting back to happier things, I remember classes with the legendary Dr. Gupta, um, who we were at King's College 
Uh, they didn't know. I mean, wait, that was, King's College is posh. You know, I wanted to go there because why should why should working people be kept out of posh places? So I wanted to go there because it was posh. It was posh, um, and I don't think they'd even heard of a Hindu. You know, they they knew about the Raj and they knew about they knew about the East India Company, but I don't think they'd actually heard of Hinduism. And we were all moaning. Look, we're reading books. We haven't seen a Hindu. So they managed to get a Hindu in, Dr. Gupta, who came in with these just mind-blowing slides of a goddess with a flower for a head. And we were all swooning. Oh, my God, that's just so wonderful. And they didn't like Dr. Gupta because she, they thought she was, a bit too, she was a bit too aesthetic. She was a bit too aesthetic. So, yeah, I mean, all this Hindu stuff. Um I'm sympathetic to many things Blavatsky says. I think that's something I'm surprised at, and I'm realizing in myself. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm, it, you know, has everybody read the whole of Hinduism? That would be impossible, I think. I mean, we also used to read Ramanujan, um, who was the big opponent of Shankara. Um, you know, you could say you could say Shankar is the idealist, and Ramanujan's uh, basically the practical, down-to-earth theism is theism. You know, and he, how would he refute? I mean, it's so modern in some ways. Um, he would refute Shankara by holding up both hands and slamming them on his desk and saying, "Look, that hurts." Which apparently, I mean, that's like the theatrics. Of Oxford and Cambridge, you know, after, after the idealists and after the Hegelians. So what did that prove to me? Nothing actually changes. These arguments go on forever. And the same sides are there forever. And that's okay. That's good. Because what we've got to do is step outside of it all and find that Zen moment that leads to Nirvana. So I could be a hippie forever and we can all we can all chew chew flower kernels and, and look at the sky and have lovely, lovely vegan lunches and so on. Um, yeah, I hope that starts the conversation rolling today, John, handing back. Yeah, except Ramanuja is wrong, except when he's right. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, uh, when we, we, we go back to... Uh, the things that were revealed by Rudolf Steiner concerning the developments that happened in the 7th and the 8th and the 9th century with the descent of cosmic intelligence, the guardian of cosmic intelligence, of course, is the Archangel Michael, and that the, the story of the Grail of Parsifal has to do with the initiation of Parsifal and the becoming the uh, inheritor of the principle of cosmic intelligence coming into the human realm, which is, is critically important because it should be remembered that in the outline of occult science or outline of esoteric science. Now they title it now because people have weird ideas about what occult means, which just means hidden. But nonetheless, in there, he says that were he to give the work another name, it would be the grail. And so this grail is, is, is that mystery, central mystery, of the esoteric Christian stream. And it has many facets when you say, well, what is the grail? Well, the grail uh, represents the cup that was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, was used at the Last Supper. And Joseph of Arimathea was at the foot of the cross with Mother Mary, Sophia, and the other women, Mary Magdalene. and the only disciple that was present was St. John, Lazarus. And so he receives the blood that's released from the body of Christ on the cross, Jesus Christ on the cross, as a result of the piercing 
by Longinus, the Roman centurion, to see if he was he passed away, and he pierced him in the side right into his heart, and the blood streamed out. And it's that vitalizing stream that's the the further unfoldment of the Christ directly entering into earth evolution. And elsewhere, Rudolf Steiner talks about the mysteries, the Arthurian mysteries of Tintagel and about how the, the 12 Arthurian knights surrounding King Arthur, that's the, an image of that 12-fold cosmic mystery. And that, see, when the Christ was perceived on the sun by Zarathustra in the aura of the sun, Ahura Mazda, and there was a prophetic tradition that he would come to earth. And so you look at, and, he, and Rudolf Steiner in the Karmic Relations series talks about that for Christ being the leader of the sun spirits in the realm of the sun, in coming to earth, it was in, in essence a death, him dying from the sun's sphere and instead of leaving behind a physical body like when we die here, he left behind the principle that's called in theosophy, the Atma, and in spiritual science is called the spirit human or spirit man. And that in the atmosphere of the earth is the Buddhic principle of the Christ, the, the life spirit, that the higher dynamic of the etheric world. And that this was being sensed in the Arthurian mysteries, this working of the etheric and the forces of nature. And in fact, there's even an account of a, a druid uh, describing the crucifixion while it was happening from him seeing it clairvoyantly, Fergus the Druid. It's, the story is written down by William Butler Yeats, but it's from an old oral tradition. And so you see that there's this mystery of, of the Celtic stream that, that, and the Arthurian stream that's that's very uh, central to the Grail mysteries. And Rudolf Steiner says that the, the Celtic folk soul had progressed to a point to where he could move on from being an archangel to being an archive. But as a sacrifice, he stayed behind in the realm of the archangel to be the inspiring spirit of esoteric Christianity. And so that's a very central mystery because that is literally that inspiration of, of these particular mysteries. And, and in the, the lore of the grail, at the end of the Gnostic period, then you see that the, the esoteric impulses of Christianity the images that the grail was taken up and, and kept by the angels, right? To return to earth, to Titerel. And, and so I, you know, it's difficult to go down some of these paths because people are so uh, variant in how much they might be familiar with some of the things of which I speak. But nonetheless, in contradistinction to the Celtic folk soul, which you could see how this displaced nature of the orphans, the, the, the Celtic people as, as an orphan of, of sorts, because they, because of the, the folk soul of the Celtic people, unless they pursued esoteric uh, pursuits, which many of them did. So you go into and you look at many of the principal writers of uh, the, like the Irish school, for example, uh, are esoteric and, and likewise on the continent with the French and there's a, a very strong uh, tradition there and in Germany so that these, the, these 
inspirations of, of the Celtic folk soul as the overriding spirit of esoteric Christianity. Now, the juncture uh, that's so significant is, is, of course, the school of Dionysius the Oreopagite in Athens that I speak to time and time again, that he was a disciple of St. Paul and the codification of, of the angelic hierarchies was the work of, of Dionysius the Oreopagite, the divine names and celestial hierarchies and all, all the work, the ecclesiastical hierarchies. So that you see him being the inspiration of both the esoteric stream and the exoteric stream. Now the exoteric stream is unique in that the, the uh, folk soul of the ancient Greeks did such a good job that he actually could have moved two stages beyond being an archangel beyond being an archive, all the way up to being a spirit of form. But rather than do that as a sacrifice, he maintained his role within the realm of the archangels to serve as the overlighting spirit of exoteric Christianity. And so you have the Celtic folk soul and the Greek folk soul being the two primary inspirational uh, groups with the, the kind of the nexus of, of the two of them being the works of Dionysius the Areopagite. And so you see Dionysius being so influential in, in uh, Christianity, especially really coming into the forefront through the works of St. Thomas Aquinas, and that the most quoted work besides the Bible itself and, and and Aristotle is, is the works of Dionysius, the Areopagite, and the celestial hierarchies and the divine names and, and all of that. So that you see that, like Douglas made the statement last week, that some people think that, that the works of Dionysius are the grail. Well, yeah, because it's the content that enables one to penetrate the mystery of cosmic intelligence, which is the secret of the grail. And that, that, that it's your capacity to understand that's the important thing towards being able to take advantage of the convolutions that have been worked into the brain through the, the workings of the Archangel Gabriel preceding 1879. And so you see that in, in being able to take this up, that it's, it's a purely universally human possibility but you have to have a vehicle to have the concepts that will provide a bridge for you. And the works of Dionysius over the centuries have served as that bridge, hence the reference to them as being the grail. Gosh, um, I remember Gurdjieff writing in riddles that aren't riddles, um, uh, when he was, I mean, his, you know, I notice all the great occultists. I love the word occult. I love the word occult. I either think of Victorian stage magicians dressed in huge turbans, um, or all the all sort of Victorian seances where somebody is on the verge of passing out and having an attack of the vapors because something's moved in the room. I mean, so I, I rather like the world the word occult. Um, I always sort of identified the serious, the big boys with esoteric. So, but I don't mind the word occult. Why not? Occult, occult, occult. You know, we're getting too sensitive about everything nowadays. Um, it's a good word. And as you say quite rightly, it's, it only means hidden. Um, that, that there, Gurdjieff, G.I. Joe, um, when all the great occultists had alter egos. I mean, his was Beelzebub, I notice. Um, even Richard Burton, I think, has an alter ego. I don't want to go too far down that that route because the point I want to make is that Beelzebub's tales to his grandson, there's a, the starship, of course, mentioned at the beginning, which uh, Beelzebub is, uh, I think he's flying to Mars at that particular point. Um, and there's a vehicle of teaching, which is the book itself, which is cheeky. That's a cheeky, cheeky, cheeky thing to do. So I tend to be at my most 
awkward when people are using literary techniques in almost an illegitimate way. Um, I know there's no such thing as an illegitimate way, but people get close to it sometimes. Um, uh, I've actually been to Tintagel, I've been to Glastonbury, I've been to those places in Wales. You wouldn't last five minutes on a Friday night if you said King Arthur was English in Wales. Let me assure you, um, your head would leave your body very quickly. Um, so, um, because he's Arthur, he's Arthur, not Arthur, not Arthur. Um, so... Oh, I don't know. I mean, I suspect there's some truth in that, but really the grail is the grail, and it's something completely different, whatever it is. I mean, von Eschenbach is very unclear what it is. One minute it's a stone. It's a sacred stone. The next minute it's a sacred vessel. So obviously it's not meant to be seen as something tangible in the usual sense at all. It's meant to be seen as something else. And certainly by the time we get into Wagner, um, I'm not angry with Wagner because, let's face it, he wasn't a member of the Nazi party um, and wouldn't have liked it. I mean, his sister, of course, um, loved all of it, which is why Wagner gets a, a bit of a bad rep. Um, certainly he veers closely sometimes to a shared narrative where the mysteries of blood are very clearly being discussed and the grail of course then becomes a people as opposed to an object and you've got to start asking right who do you mean by that and what do you mean by that and so his version of Parzival which is breathtakingly beautiful for me it always makes me slightly uncomfortable because I'm not quite sure which direction that's going in even though, of course, I mean, his anti-Semitic views are well known, um, terribly, terribly sad. But I, I also can't demand that people from a different time be well-educated postmodern liberals. And the whole of history has not been. And if we want to rewrite history to make it this eternally bland nothing, which lots of people seem to want to do. Um, so we, human beings never learn anything. We never progress. We never evolve. Because we've all been the same all the time. I mean, the, the bit that amused me recently was Thomas Jefferson, who actually is one of my heroes. Um, there, there were statues of him or a painting or something. I think it was a statue being taken down somewhere in the States because he'd been a slave owner. I mean, the worst example is Queen Victoria. During the recent Black Lives Matter kerfuffle here, um, that, that particular movement, I understand the movement. I understand people getting sick of a social issue, being swept under the carpet or redefined. That happens all, this, all the time with LGBTQIA issues, all the time. So I understand the frustration. I understand the annoyance. But it doesn't mean you can go berserk and say anything and everything becomes a fabulism, which is partly true and partly not. I mean, the, certainly one of the wonderful, one of the beautiful statues of Queen Victoria in, uh, I think it was off Hyde Park, was it Green Park, Hyde Park, was defaced and had um, paint thrown all over it because she was a slave owner. Actually, that's part of the history. Personally, she wasn't. Um, and what she did was make sure slavery was outlawed in her lands. Um could she eradicate it? No, but she could make it a very uncomfortable social reality, which de facto, which in fact she did. So, you know, I'm I'm a little uncomfortable at the rewriting of history and the dumbing down of history, the dumbing down of everything, which seems to be very prevalent at the moment, and playing into the hands of a very increasingly sinister ruling elite that absolutely love every minute of it. Do you know normal working class people? You know nothing and you have no brains. You suck. Just do as we tell you and everybody will be happy. And apparently some people are really beginning to buy into that, which is astonishing. But having been, as I say, to the some of the sacred sites of, of the Arthurian cycle, um, I'm more of the opinion that it was astro theology, if we're looking for alternative explanations. I mean, certainly von Eschenbach and Wagner reinterpret the matter of Britain as it used to be called in their own way and for their own purposes. 
Um, so for Wagner in that particular opera, it seems to be something to do with the amelioration of German blood, <clears throat> which also seems to be suggesting that it lost its psychic abilities. The German people have lost their, their innate psychic abilities somewhere along the line, and only that will bring them back. Maybe that's what he was getting at. Maybe it's not. I'm saying that for the simple reason that I think the original of that particular opera, the original title was actually The Faux Destroyers, and it was set about, it was set amongst a group of Theravadin Buddhist monks. So you have to be a bit skeptical that it was this big, this big celebration of German nationalism, if that's really the origin of that opera. Um, and in von Eschenbach's case. Um, you know, you see, you're talking about the chakras. No, he couldn't talk about the chakras because the church would have had him murdered. That's why he's not writing openly about the chakras, and which is why the Holy Grail keeps t changing form. Um, no, I'm, I'm into I'm into astro theology at the minute. I think that's wonderful because it fits in so neatly with, with Steiner and Blavatsky, of course. Where, um, yeah, the, you know, the the emperor of the sun spirits. And, you know, the cross is the cross of the zodiac. The sun is literally the sun. And its consciousness, it now irradiates human affairs. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful idea? Um, I don't know where all this is leading. But as, again, I, I think you're looking at two ways possibly of achieving higher states of consciousness. There's the Zen method, which I'm beginning to prefer because it sort of cuts out the middle hand. It's between you and the universe. It cuts out the middleman. Um, oh, shall I? Shall I? No, just sit there and meditate. Um, so that strikes me as very practical and down to earth. You know, let me say one thing about Gnostics. Um, I meant to have a, a certain reputation amongst Gnostics. If you spend your life talking about comparative metaphysics, you're not a Gnostic. You're some sort of a cult historian, not on John's level, by the way. You're some sort of some sort of um, chronicler, but you're not an Gnostic. You know, are you writing this from a state of superconsciousness? No. So you're not an Gnostic. The end. Um, oh, there's the Hindu way. I, why do we keep coming back to that today? Um, which strikes me as equally intriguing and beautiful and was sort of a way I think I used to prefer at one point, where you allow the imagination to take to wing, you, you inflame the fantasies of the mind and you allow them to evolve into imagination and that imagination itself takes to the wing. I mean, people forget the, the eagle of Zeus was actually the human imagination and it had to fly to the feet of Zeus uh, or, or, or uh, Jove, um, same, same personage. Uh, so you needed an enlivened, uh, a vitalized imagination to get to the gods. Um, you know, all these wonderful, endless tales that are semi-true, semi-mythic, semi-history, semi-occult, like the Bhagavad Gita. You know, if you if someone says, is that true, they've completely missed the point of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so there's that other way the Hindus would say of sort of enfolding and lifting up and reifying human consciousness until it takes much greater strides than it's capable of doing at the minute. I just, I suppose as I'm getting older, I'm more suspicious of that way in the sense it can, it can go wrong more often. And you end up telling yourself, <coughs> you know, a sort of a series of stories by which you know you're right and everybody's wrong. And there doesn't seem to be any way to test that. I mean, the trouble with, <clears throat> who is to blame for the trouble with modern religion? Religious people. Um, the fact most of the churches simply refuse to go into the marketplace of ideas and argue their case, which is astonishing. Jesus went into the marketplace. He talked to people. He argued with people. He didn't sit in an ivory tower or he didn't hide in the local synagogue, at, you know, refusing to come out in case somebody showed a few problems with what he was saying. He got stuck in. He went to the marketplace and he talked to people. Um, who's to blame for all of that? Us. And what's the only way to correct it? Get into the hurly burly of mainstream intellectual life and say, by the way, we've got some things we're very proud of. 
And this is it. And we should be much more willing to defend our own case and stop this massive imbalance between so-called belief and so-called unbelief in these presently unreal terms. I think I said quite a few inflammatory things. So I'll hand you back. I'll hand it back to you, John. I hope I said some inflammatory things. Yeah, there's a saying, and I'm not directing it at you. There's a saying uh, that perhaps it'd be best if, uh, if, if you remain silent and conceal your ignorance rather than open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> I've got, I've, got to back in there. I've got to come back in there. The difference between you and them is that you're an anthroposophist and you're not simply writing books about books. I think, you know, you are a historian in the classic sense um, of, of chronicler and commentator and experiencer. No, that's certainly, I do not see you as the court jester. I never have done. I do not see you as anything apart from the real deal. I'm having a go at people nowadays in the academy. You know, how, do they, how can they take a paycheck at the end of the week, at the end of the month, feeling they've done a good job? Now, all they do is, and I love talking about books, but they let one book comment on another book, and then they call that the study of history. And if you look back at sources, this, oh, my God, what are you doing? All of a sudden, there's something wrong. And though you're not meant to look at sources. Right, now I'll shut up. No, that's the farthest thing to talk yeah. about. You're the real deal, and we need more people like you. But my worry is we're not going to get them in a hurry. That's my, my worry at that. Well, in, in any regard, uh, perhaps I'll explain it thusly. Uh, I love astral theology. That's basically the gospel of Mark. Is astral theology that, that that the cosmic aspect, and in 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 the Gospel of Mark, what is the emphasis on? I mean, Jesus Christ is running around healing people, healing the blind, chasing demons out of people. I mean, he's doing it. You know, he's not talking about doing it; he's actually doing it, and so. This cosmic perspective, uh, there there are people out there, you know, like uh, Gerald Massey, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, and and Blavatsky to a large extent, where they get into the astral theology and then they go and therefore, meaning oh that's all it is, is it's just it's just a a mythic presentation of astral theology. And missing the point that it can be that, and that's just one aspect. And Rudolf Steiner in the, the lecture cycle on the Gospel of St. Matthew, he gets into talking about that whole idea of that, you know, if you take a, a one person will write a, say something about a tree, and then a, another person standing on the other side, you know, they, they write a poem and somebody else paints a picture and they all they're 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 all of the tree right but they're all unique and so it's that uniqueness and the multifaceted aspect of scripture that that makes it so engaging because it, we literally don't have the capacity to be able to encompass all of scripture we're, we're just uh, incapable at this stage of our evolution to be able to get there and all these various approaches are are all good if, if understood that they're they're an aspect of what we're doing there and that it's not the final answer but see the tendency in an age of scientism is to want closure aha i found the answer it's like when Einstein came along. I have the answer. It's like that kid in class that teachers will will present something, and uh, who could tell me? And the kid raises his hand. I know the answer, and he gives it gives his uh, version. Uh, that's all well and good, and and there are certain rudimentary ideas of which we all share. One and one is two. Okay, that's 
if you disagree with that, you well, you're crazy. But yet, all you got to do is go into nature, and one and one, geez, it could be five, it could be ten, because you got a husband and a wife, and they have five kids, or they have ten kids. So <laughs> the, this whole way of, of reducing things down to equations is interesting for its own sake. But is it, is it, does it embody some kind of universal truth in the larger sense to be able to understand uh, every level of being? No. That's, that's, that's more than clear. But uh, I, I wasn't expected to go down that road, but that's, that's a good road. Ultimately, what are you saying? All roads, yeah. Well, yeah, all roads can lead to astral theology. That's true. And in fact, Rudolf Steiner made the point of that the really the father of modern astronomy is Johannes Kepler. And Kepler said that in the future there will be a, a, a Christological astrology, that, that it will become part of the language of Christ is basically what we're saying, and is what, which is what is coming into being through spiritual science. And because in order to be able to go into the multifaceted, multi-level uh, interpretive approach in, in which where you're, you're working with the mysteries of space, like the hermetic stream or time, like the stream the mosaic stream, that that to be able to bring in both of those elements into one's level of discourse. Because if you go to the Hermetic writings, for example, you're not going to find anything in there about time. It's just not there. You go back, uh, the, the, it's like they'll just put a symbol up in ancient Egypt to represent that's that, you know. Over there, they don't really get into talking about it much, other than they, they have the dynastic chronologies and all of that, you know. But that's that's that blood mystery of ancestors. But these two elements that were inherited from Zarathustra, the etheric body going to Moses, and the astral body going to the founder of pharaonic culture that's referred to as Hermes in the Greek writings. But uh, if you go back, the, perhaps it's Menes, but I'm sure that there's more than one incarnation, as there usually is. When If you get into ancient cultures, they invariably say that this indiv great individual came along and he gave us you know, writing and architecture and art and all these things. That They all say that or a small group of people like the the seven rishis seven guys came up and they gave these divine utterances upon these divine utterances we based our culture so they all have that because that's what according to spiritual science that's the way things come into being and so that when you look at like for example spiritual science well you'd be hard pressed to study spiritual science without studying with Steiner. It's simple because he's the guy. I mean, and people that go to other Christian initiate teachers like uh, Daskalos, uh, Stylianos of Teslis at Cyprus, or uh, Peter Dunoff, you know, Bensa Duno over in Bulgaria, very, very profound teachers. But yet, when you go to them and you start asking questions, they go, well, just go read Rudolf Steiner. You know, because it's already been done. You know, there's, it's just like in getting into earlier periods. Well, go read uh, Dionysius the Areopagite. He covers it. It's that idea, and it's a, it's a ne Neoplatonic approach because you're the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so that the 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 uh, understanding of the of the threefold being of man is is critical towards understanding and solving any. Uh, problem whether philosophical or artistic actually and so you have the true is, is that's old sadder and the beautiful 
and the good. So that you have this always this procession of three things that leads to a fourth. There's no recapitulation of the fourth. Then there's three that follow the fourth. And that's your seven great mysteries all over again. So you have the mystery of the abyss, which is that uncreated time that 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 Zervan Akarana that, that Zarathustra mentions. That's that that old Saturn mystery that's recapitulated in the development of, of the earth itself, where this the sun separates from the earth with the higher beings going with the sun and leaving the earth together with the moon. And then eventually the moon is separated from the earth with Jehovah Elohim. So there's a recapitulation, a thematic recapitulation, but there's no repetition of any fourth period. And so you have this movement into the future to where, as St. Paul says, ye shall be as the angels in the Jupiter period, we shall be as the angels because we will have completed the development of the fourth principle, which is the ego, the, the uh, true ego, as a macrocosmic principle. And remind me, because at some point we're going to have to develop an understanding of the distinctions between a macrocosmic principle and a microcosmic principle. Because when you're getting into the pre-Christian uh, mysteries, preceding Golgotha, you have the, the, the microcosmic principles involved. Whereas the macrocosmic principle is the divine spark of the ego, the I am that I am. And so that's, that's an important distinction, but we don't have enough time to get into that today. But I gave you an inkling of what might come. But there's something he made reference to, very minute reference to in the, what, 1907, I believe it was, in Paris, uh, at the invitation of Edouard Charest, 1906, 1907, I forget which, uh, the Esoteric Christian lecture series that was uh, translated in English by one of my mentors, Rennie Corita, the student of Walter, Walter Johannes Stein. So here we have David, Reverend David William Perry, descended from a director of the East India Company, <laughs> a dubious distinction over here in America, and the author of Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg in the Arts, edited by Daniela Erendus, the very talented young man. And that's that's well worth getting. You can get that on Amazon. And you have his Shakespearean study, The Grammar of Witchcraft. And no, it's not a book on a book of spells. Not, not literally, although maybe it is. <laughs> getting accused, they're gonna burn you at the stake. And then there's uh, Caliban's Redemption, his Shakespearean esque poetry. No, that's not David on the cover. I, I don't know what that is. And all those books, as wonderful as they are, because he is a, a master of the English language, in my humble opinion, and a member of the Royal Asiatic Society, which is impressive. I'm not sure what that means, but it's impressive. The, the Brits are very big on honorifics and clubs. They're, uh, they're, everybody belongs to a club, and uh, except for David. He, he belongs to many clubs. You got a club? I'll join. And for myself, my, my first uh, book is the, the Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian order. And there's a uh, foreword by Douglas Gabriel and has texts and diagrams, great many diagrams. And uh, my second volume is the Arcana of Light on the Path, the Star Wisdom of the Tarot and Light on the Path, where I Utilize in both books the 22 arcana of the tarot as a storyboard, a trestle board, shall we say, 
for explicating spiritual science. And in these books, in both of them are included grail diagrams in which I lay out the cosmology, the cosmosophy of Rudolf Steiner in great detail based on the researches of Aaron Fritz Pfeiffer and Walter Johann Stein and many uh, individuals, but principally from the, the diagrams that were across my desk many, many years ago by Aaron Fritz Pfeiffer, handwritten with watercolors, are really beautiful. And so my books are available on eBay, and uh, but I can't really put the link underneath this here because they block it on, on YouTube and on Facebook. That's okay because I have my academia link below and you can click on that and that will lead you to my eBay links where you can get my books. Now, if you, if you feel so moved to be generous and buy uh, David and I a cup of coffee, you can go to, uh, he's, his cup's empty. It's also quite tea stained. And you can go to paypal.me forward slash D-P-A-R-R-Y-777 for Reverend David and for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And you can buy us a cup of coffee or make some form of, of sharing that, that you feel a move to so do. And so um, I got that in. I sometimes forget, I think. It's, uh, I guess I'm not ambitious enough to move in certain circles. But so it, it, to bring this all together, I think it's important in, in the challenging times in which we're encountered, it, it, this quotation of, of uh, Friedrich uh, von Hardenberg, Novalis, the poet Novalis, who uh, died a young man. He was born on May 2nd, 1772, and died on March 25th of 1801. So a very uh, young man, uh, but one of the greatest souls that I know of. And he said, when it has become clear to us that the world is God's kingdom, when this great conviction has once penetrated our minds in its infinite fullness, then we go comforted along life's dark path and contemplate its storm and dangers with a deep divine peace. Amen. And so uh, we still have some time left. And, uh, but I wanted to make sure that I got that in because I thought it was important. And also the, in recapitulating this whole idea that, that I developed in previous episodes of Goethe referring to himself as being a hypsisterian and that the hypsisterian is, is somebody who reveres the, the genius and excellence of any creation of man, whether they be uh, Christian, Jew, Muslim, pagan, whatever. Somebody did a good job on something that that's worth venerating. And that's a hypsisterian that he aspired himself. And I see myself as, as a, a aspiring to be a hypsisterian and, and expand beyond the limit limits of the thinking of Keith and Kim, that there's more than, more than that in this world. And so in, in getting close to that, again, we go to uh, Rudolf Steiner mentioning that, that there's this, this uh, meditative process that he shared. And he said, the pupil should imagine that his teacher or master is standing before him in the shape of Moses. And that Moses asks him, so you'd like to know why you're not getting ahead on the esoteric path? Yes, I'll tell you why. It's because you worship the golden calf. 
Then the pupil sees the golden calf next to Moses. And the latter lets fire come up from the earth that consumes the golden calf and turns it into powder. He throws this powder into some clear water and gives the mixture to the pupil to drink. A few centuries ago, any esoteric would have been able to understand this image. Now it must be explained as follows. When we go back in our memory, we get to a point where our memories stop and ego consciousness began. What lies before that is what we made out of ourselves in previous incarnations and brought into this one. That's the golden calf that we worship without realizing it, our sheath nature. And so we all have that. We, we are born into whatever. You could have been born, you know, in uh, China, and you would be revering uh, Confucius, perhaps, or maybe even a, a party member. Uh, and so the karma plays into it so much in the way we think. And in becoming a universally human, you have to be able to look over the horizon, find out what other people think, and find that there's similarities, but there are also distinctions. And the distinctions, in many regards, is the most important part, especially distinctions relative to geography and time. And, and going back to Zarathustra's ideas of time, in, in that he says that Evil is goodness at the wrong time. And so that you have this, this subtlety and, and, and to be able to refrain from judgment and use discernment rather than judgment and, and be able to make decisions regarding how you approach things can give you a more universally human vantage point because in one of his lectures, Rudolf Steiner made the point he says in the principle of love or balance and he made it as if love is synonymous with balance or equilibrium and you see that that when they say god is love what what is the, the path of christ what is that path it's that balance point between the the immateriality of lucifer and the excessive materialism of araman and to be able to to hold those two passive imbalance at bay and be able to find that middle point. And then you go back and you realize that's exactly what Navalis was saying, finding that, that center of peace in the indwelling presence of God, that that's going to take you the longest way on this on this path if one can find that and mind you he he had been very set with with difficulty because the uh, sophie von kuntz who he was to marry died a, a really tragic death and soon after he passed away himself and so he he had his experience of tragedy at his young age, but yet he's one of the most penetrating of souls and his, his words are his pollen that, that, or seeds that you could water and they sprout and you can think about for years. And so things that are of value have that kind of a character. It's like Rudolf Steiner says, reading the Gospel of John is like walking into a meadow. Whereas I look at some books like Darwin and I read it, it's like everything goes into granulation. That there's, it's not a, it's, it's not a living thought process. It's an abstract construct, because it's not based on a reality. Because that's, it's not real. Yes, there is metamorphosis, as Goethe revealed, but the the way in which it's manifested, according to spiritual science, it isn't. We're not descended from monkeys. That's 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 not borne out according to the Akashic record. That, that that particular type, those animals left the tree at an earlier stage of development so that, they're, that we're, we precede them. See? And, and, and likewise, bears back during the Atlantean period are, are 
souls that didn't make the cut and stopped it at the crystallized at, at a particular stage of development and didn't continue forward. And so that's what happens when when you don't participate in the 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 intention of the divine spiritual powers, you get left behind. And that's where the, the spirits of opposition come from. They were spirits that were left behind at a previous stage of evolution. And so they're attempting to foster that. Uh, but it's inappropriate because it's no longer that time. It's no longer what's going on. And so in getting into that, you see that it's all about context and, and as they say the devil is in the details yes and so we're getting near the end and i and i love to uh, ask david to consecrate our humble endeavor here with a prayer but i like to leave him enough time because i know he has at least one last soliloquy or diatribe i'm never sure which that he's going to uh spin before he gets to his prayer. Well, yeah, just a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm not against Darwin because I think we need every voice imaginable in that great debate. So I'm, the irony is I'm not against materialist science. I just wish they could be a bit more intelligent. Um, the more voices, the better. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society, not a mere member. Um, but that, of course, is to do with the fact that I've dealt with bloody Central Asians for years. Um, so I imagine that happened because of my, my background. You know, the other one of the other caps I wear um, is I'm a Central Asian enthusiast, and I've done a lot of work with them with Azerbaijan. And, uh, um, I put on some plays by a, a very great Azerbaijani playwright at one point. Yes, and I know that's the Caucasus. It's not Central Asia, but thereby hangs another tale. Um, oh, you said another thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, Paris. I mean, I know we're like wildebeest, but I don't think there's a there's a direct descent from me, <laughs> whoever this other Parry was. Um, and, I, and I can assure everybody, not a single penny of the East India Company has ever penetrated my impoverished life, um, which is why, which is why it would, it would be nice if it had done, but I'm afraid it didn't do. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of the Parry, who was the uh, priest of Elizabeth I, maybe, or of course Hubert Parry, who worked with William Blake um, to come up with Jerusalem. I prefer those Parrys. I'll, I'll just see one more thing before the prayer. Um, I UFOs. The, the American military has suddenly admit they're there, and they what is it now? UAPs, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. So all of a sudden they're legit. You know, people knew something was going on in the first place, but all of a sudden they're legit. Um, I don't understand the the problems with that sort of type of discourse. I understand the military problems, like if these things can come and go as they want, there's no such thing as a safe military airspace. I understand that. Um, but also there's the, the churlish, we don't want this discussed because it might raise people's vision. Um, that's the, the, the downside of all of this. Um, Astrotheology, UFOs, I suspect we've had a, I suspect there are golden and glittering footprints all over this planet from elsewhere. Um, and certainly theosophy, anthroposophy, certainly some of the sages of the past suggest that. I mean, certainly Alice Bailey talks about a hierarchy, which actually, of course, came from a higher level of Venus to kickstart this Earth, um, which is very, very interesting. I mean, that's a different way of saying Alien, alien intelligences found this world retarded and it wasn't keeping up to schedule and they gave it a bit of a kick up the arse. That is a very, very interesting statement. I suspect there's a continuum be, be, between all these statements. Um, and certainly I'd like to get into Alice Bailey at some point with you. At one point, she, you know, her, her, I mean, unlike Blavatsky, 
you know, at her Blavatsky's masters uh, are sort of like masters of yoga and meditation. You know, you always get the impression they could pop round in the afternoon for tea. You never get that with Bailey's masters. I mean, these are people dealing with cosmic realities, but you know, nonetheless interesting. So I suspect we need to look at that and the whole continuum uh, of intergalactic interplanetary discourse that's beginning to evolve in front of our in front of our faces these are not simply dark and restrictive times new forms of discourse are emerging around us and sometimes under our noses and we're not we're not really aware that that's happening um so that's i suppose why i'd like to pray for new horizons uh, sometimes most times it's always darkest before the dawn we are going through a very bad time as a species as a world as a planet as various peoples everybody's against everybody discourse is polarizing you're either with us or against us which is not quite what the bible meant um it's a time when people have forgotten the shared humanity which our dear friend john talked about it's a time when people have forgotten to take joy in all the great creations of the human spirit so what i want to do listeners viewers my dear 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 friend john is pray wholeheartedly for a greater vision in the days ahead a deeper understanding of our own mission we've all got a mission on this earth and a much much more expansive view of the divine plan in which we're all each one of us an integral part may the light of christ be with us all in the hours and days ahead amen amen well i can't thank you enough and, and to all our friends that are watching this now or later on i bid you adieu